series on uh, John chapter 6 on the bread of life, the bread of life. John chapter 6 begins with Jesus feeding 5,000 with multitudes following him. And then at the end of John chapter 6, everybody's leaving him. Isn't it amazing how things can change? One moment, one day, they're ready to make him king. And then just a few days later, not even, everybody's leaving him, not following him. All the disciples left him except for the 12. And we find that something happened in John chapter 6 that's recorded by the Holy Spirit. He feeds 5,000. He walks on water. And he introduces a teaching he calls it the bread of life. He says, I'm the bread of life. And so we're doing a five-part series, the bread of life series on John chapter 6. And this is part four of five parts. The first one was God's warning, which I'll remind you. On verse 27, when Jesus said, most assuredly. Now, when he says most assuredly, or in some Bibles it will say truly, truly, or in some it will say verily, verily. Some people get all confused over that and figure why it's all the same thing. In other words, listen to me, this is the truth. Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. This is God's warning. God has given a warning. The warning is that when you seek the Lord, seek him for who he is. It says, do not labor. Remember, they rode to find him across the sea. They finally find him. They even say, where were you? How'd you get here? They're all filled with investigation. They feel like Mr. Monk. Like they finally have figured it all out. And here's the Lord. And hey, we, we found you. We've been searching. We've been investigating. We finally have come to where you are, and, and they're looking almost for con commendation. And the Lord really doesn't give them a commendation. Instead, he says, you sought me because your bellies were filled. There is a religion that is self-satisfying. There's a religion that takes place, rituals and formulas. Things that we like to do that satisfy the flesh nature and clears our conscience or maybe eases our conscience, even in Christian circles where we can not necessarily seek the Lord for the Lord himself, but to develop our personal relationship, to seek first the kingdom of God, to allow his holiness and his love and his righteousness, his goodness, his mercy, his humility to overtake us. Rather, we have a tendency sometimes in even Christian circles to seek the Lord for the things that he can give us and seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That's what Isaiah says. And so we find that God's warning came forth. They sought him for the appetites of the flesh. And he said, no, don't seek me for the appetites of the flesh nature. Rather, seek the Lord while he may be found. The next one we went to was God's work. God's work. It says in verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. Wait a minute now, you mean I can walk out of here and know what the work of God is? You mean it's not lighting a candle? You mean it's not opening a soup kitchen? It's not, uh, it's not going out and, and handing out tracts? It's not just wearing a Christian t-shirt? I'm not saying, I'm not speaking against those things. I'm saying the work of God begins with this. And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. All endeavors that we do for the kingdom of God, for the church, everything that works that we do must be built on the foundation of believing in him. Everything that we do as a church, everything that we do as a person, as a saint of God, must be built on this foundation that you sought him and believed him. You sought the Lord. You believe him. That's the work of God. The foundation 
of working for the Lord is to believe in Him, to believe in what He said, to believe in the promises of God. He said, I'm going away, but I'm coming back for you. Well, yeah, okay, I believe that. No, no. Do you believe that? Do you really believe in the sense that you are leading your life? And is Gary Cody leading his life, conducting his affairs, uh, conducting his thought patterns of his life in accordance with the knowledge that he's coming back? That he's prepared a place for me? Believing is aligning yourself with that belief. It's not just mental agreement. It's not, just, yeah, that's cool. Sadly to say, there's much Christian doctrine taking place, many relationships with the Lord that are taking place, that people are leading their lives that you can't tell any difference between them and the activities of the world. Yet on Sundays they come to church while others go out to breakfast first. And so we need to understand that the Lord gave a warning, God's warning. Labor for the things of God. Labor for God. If you're going to exercise activity, then be one that seeks the Lord. Next, God's, uh, God's work. Believe in Him. And then thirdly, we came to God's will. It proceeds, He goes forth and He says, verse 39, This is the will of the Father. Wait a minute now, you know, I can know the work of God, and I can know the will of God. For this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all He has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. Verse 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The will of God is that we would believe. And the will of God is that he is desiring, he is focused on, his aim is the resurrection. The new life in Christ is about to burst forth. If only we could see see. If only we could truly see what is taking place on the inside. If only we could see really the invisible church that is being filled with the glory of Christ. The natural eye is blind to it. Scripture makes it clear that the natural man cannot see, cannot receive, doesn't understand the things of God. God is spirit. If we could only see see the invisible world and the glory that is being manifest but currently hid in the body of Christ that will be revealed. Romans chapter 8 says that will be revealed in its time. The sons of God will be revealed. It says that all of creation is looking forward to this. What a day that will be. I love when the sun rises over the horizon and you start seeing it just spread forth and darkness flees from the light. And in the, in the hour of its rising, I can look right at the sun. I can look right at it. And I can just look at it. Until it hits just above a certain line. And all of a sudden you're starting to hide a little bit. And all of a sudden it's at full moon and you're like this. But you can't see a thing. You're covering your eyes and you're wearing a hat just to try to see. But when the Lord's glory is revealed, you're going to be just like Him. And you'll be able to just look and be part of, for you are right in the glory of the sun. The morning star that He placed in your heart will be one with Him. And you'll be able to see the glory of the Lord, the resurrection of the body of Christ is coming and even now is rising in your own heart and your own spirit. And if it is not, then you poor soul. For you and I need to call upon the Lord and say, Lord, let the burning fire of your presence be, be, be part of me, be in me, overtake me, dominate everything that I am. And now we come to part four. In verse 47. Matter of fact, let's lead up to it. Let's go to verse 41. Verse 41 in reading. It says, then Jews then the Jews then murmured against him. Look at verse 41. It says, the Jews then murmured against him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Now, think of that. 
Why is it every time the word of God is spoken, murmuring arises? Murmuring. Don't you love that word? That's a sermon in itself. How do you come up with that word? Murmur. It, it doesn't really say anything. Kind of like murmuring. <laughs> and murmuring is directly connected with unbelief. When you hear, when you see, when you catch a little bit of murmuring taking place out of someone's mouth, know that that is directly rooted, a branch is directly connected to the unbelief that is resting in their heart. Unbelief always, always manifests through the mouth in a way of complaining, a way of murmuring. Sometimes it's just that low grumble. Whereas you're never really comprehensible, but they sure get the message across. Always a seed of dissension that is being shared. Sometimes in a prayer circle. Got to put a little holy touch on it. But we come now to this doctrine again that Jesus is going to capture. Capture everything he's been saying. And he proceeds and, and they said, and they said, verse 42, is this is, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? See, they're confused. And you notice that when people can't catch what the word of God is saying, it obviously is someone else's fault. It's certainly not going to be their fault. They don't understand, so Jesus must be lying. They're walking in unbelief. Unbelief can't catch it. Unbelief is hardness of heart. It creates a hard shell that cannot be penetrated. It, it's a protective measure to keep the weakness within. And here we find that they are murmuring and they can't catch what he's saying is, how can he come down from heaven? This is Jesus who came out from his father and mother. We know Joseph, we know Mary, we know where they come from. How can this be? And they exclude it all, they dismiss it all. Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. Verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Again, the resurrection. Verse 45, It is written in the prophets. He refers to scripture to give validity. And they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Now, verse 47 to 51 is where we're capturing part four, God's way. We start off with way, ladies and gentlemen. God's way excludes. God's way excludes. Boy, we hate that word. People hate that word, you know. But God's way excludes every other way. People don't like that word. What do you mean, exclude? My wife and I were going down uh, Interstate 90, I believe it was, and we saw a big billboard with one of the mainline denominations that said, God doesn't exclude anyone. Really? What about in heaven there are no liars, no murderers? No sin. We go through and read all of the things that are not allowed, not going to be part of. Sounds like exclusion to me. On the other hand, it's he's got tremendous inclusion in the sense of that which is pure, that which is holy, that which is lovely, that which is righteous, that which is of God, that is open-armed. That which is of him, he alone is good. Jesus himself said, God alone is good. So when we're looking and realizing that God has provided a way, God's way, I've always wondered when we say that there's all roads lead to heaven like all roads lead to Rome. There's a variety of ways that people can go. Jesus himself made it clear and he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that life has provided. Why would one perfect God need any more than one perfect way? He doesn't need to provide a variety and host of ways 
He's provided one way. And the one way happens to be not a what, but a who. Jesus Christ himself. Believe, work towards me. Know me. Change my heart, O oh God. He said, I am the bread of life. I therefore want his character, his conduct, and his concerns in my life. If I am not, if you are not, if we are not yielding to develop his conduct, his character, and his concerns in our life, then somebody else's is. And that something else or somebody else is not God. It's really, the choice is, I am going to yield, I'm going to seek, I want to know, I want to have the bread of life nourishing God's character in my life. I am going to seek, I want to know, I want the bread of life to develop his conduct in my life. I want to seek, I want to know, I want to develop, I'm going to yield so that God's concerns are dominating my life. If I'm not doing that, if Gary Cody, I'm speaking to myself, put your name in there. Put any apostle in there. Put anybody's name in there. Whether they be president or pope, put anybody's name in there. If we're not allowing God's character, God's conduct, God's concerns as manifested and revealed in Christ Jesus to develop and dominate who we are, then somebody else's is, and that somebody else is not him. We start, therefore, taking the blessings of God, that which he has provided, we start receiving all that he has given, and rather than being a servant of God, we take what he has, we don't even say thank you, and we stay a slave to his greatest enemy. Talk about a slap in the face. Because every good and perfect gift has come from above, we receive it. How many people do you know today are wealthy, have fame, have fortune, have good health, have a variety of things that they're enjoying today and do not get up in the morning or before any meal and ever say thank you to Christ Jesus. Could care less, don't give a thought towards it. Just leading their lives as though that sun's going to rise and stay between 70 and 75 degrees the rest of their life. Without giving thought that that sun is 93 million miles away and we're complaining if it drops 2 degrees below 70. As we spin around and go on an axis. God has provided a way. And we have a choice of what are we going to nourish. But God has said this, I am the bread of life. If you and I want life, life eternal, life everlasting, the life that is in God, not just existence, life, the life of God, then we must partake of the bread of heaven. We must. It's a command that life eternal is directly connected to believing in Christ Jesus. Believing seeks to have and to consume the bread of life. And the bread of life leads to everlasting life. The bread of life he says, I am the bread of life. Verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. They died in unbelief. It was temporal to nourish the temporal. Provided by God, but it was not the true bread that comes from heaven. Verse 50, this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. God is not for you dying. God is not pro-death. We are saturated with death around our existence so much that we've grown accustomed to that normal. 
We've seen cemeteries and roadside kill. We've got the smell of death everywhere. You and I carry the smell of death on us. You say, well, how can that be? Don't take a shower for a couple weeks. <laughs> Come back and tell me if that is so. It's not a pleasant odor. Go and witness to some of the inner city people who are living on the streets that haven't taken a bath for a year. And come back and tell me if you've smelled death. It's everywhere. We shower daily here in America, and if someone doesn't, it's ooh. How much time did you spend on just trying to clean yourself up before you went out the front door? We have the death all around us that we've grown accustomed to that it's normal. But God is not for death. He is for life. He's life. And he's provided the bread of life. And he's invited whosoever. The invitation has gone forth to each and every one of us, each and every day, to partake of the bread that has come down from heaven. And he said, I am he. I am the bread of life. I am the bread that life has provided. That if you eat of me, you shall have everlasting life. It is a daily nourishment until you see him. It's a hourly nourishment until you see him. I hope and pray that you wake up in the morning and think Jesus in your life. I hope and I pray that you think Jesus with the actions and decisions that you make. I hope and I pray that you think Jesus Christ, the bread of life that has come down from heaven, with everything that you do, with everything that you say. The very breath that has been deposited in your lungs and in my lungs has been given by God. And if we're expending it on murmuring and dissension, then we have something to answer for. The very dime in our pockets has been provided for by God Almighty. And we shall give account for what we've done with every necro. He's the one who's provided the food on our table. And we shall give account for everything as believers with what we've done with it. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that every time you sit at a table, enjoy a meal, something died that you might live? Every time that you and I sit at a table and nourish ourselves to live one more day, something died that you might live. Well, in the kingdom of heaven, someone died that you might live. It's God's way. <clears throat> you and I will never, ever escape it. We will be part of it or not part of it. We will nourish by it or we will reject it and starve ourselves to death. I've seen people today who are spiritual anorexia, spiritual bulimia, People who gorge and then spit it up. Because they want to the wait look the way they used to. Please listen to me, God's way. People who are starving themselves from the word of God, anorexia, starving themselves. The things that take place in the natural reflect that which is taking place in the spiritual. And there's an anorexia that is overtaking young people today who are being starved from the true word of God, who are being preached to the 21 steps of this and the seven steps of that, and the how to get along and how to overcome your social difficulties by taking a pill. Gee, have a hard time looking at someone in the eye? Take this. <laughs> can't discipline this, can't discipline that. Filled with attention deficit? Yeah, it's called lack of discipline. Tons of things that are going on today that we can handle with a pill, that we can handle with a potion, a lotion, or a pill. Bulimia, 
where a person gorges and then spits it all out. Just have the taste in their mouth to satisfy a craving of an appetite. Unfortunately, today we've got many people who are gorging and then spitting it all out. Just want to look the way that I'm, I perceive the way I should look. I am the bread of life, he said. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. People don't want to hear that. People don't want to hear the word that you're dead. I've gone into churches. I've seen people who talk to people who have all kinds of God on their tongue and they're dead. Dead. Unbelief. Verse 50. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. That one may eat of it and not die. Verse 51 we end with, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. In this life of death, darkness, and deception. Oh, Pastor Cody, you're preaching doom and gloom and I'm walking out of here feeling discouraged. No, you should feel encouraged. Because the bread of life has come and he's come to you. And in the midst of this death, darkness, and deception, he's brought forth his light, he's brought forth his bread, he's brought forth the truth. We no longer have to be in deception. We now understand the truth and can walk accordingly. We no longer have to be in the kingdom of darkness. We have the light of God. He said, you are the light. We can walk in the light. In the midst of this death, we don't have to walk with the smell of death. We now instead walk in the, in the light that he's provided. We are encouraged, and we to encourage us one with another with this, that we're no longer given to the things that are not of God. We can now give ourselves and partake of that which is of God and share it with others and say, do you want the bread of life? The bread of life is for everyone. Sadly to say, though, many just plainly don't want it. Choosing instead to live their lives in the sensual environment that we find ourselves in. Rather than the sincerity of God. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ has proclaimed it. I am the bread of life. Life has provided this bread. What is the bread? My flesh that will be given for you. My flesh that has been given for you. Eat, he said. Eat. Partake. And let this life nourish life in you. Sometimes sweet. Sometimes bitter. But always a blessing. Always a blessing. In Jesus' name. Ladies and gentlemen, saints of God, God's warning has gone forth. God's work has been proclaimed. God's will has been revealed. And God's way has been made known as well. He is the bread of life. The bread that has come down from heaven and given life everlasting. Before us each and every day, there is the way of death and the way of life. Each and every day, we're eating. We're eating so that we can have life. Meaning we like life better than death. I've seen both. I've been next to a live body and I've been next to a dead body. I like the live one. You probably do too. I've been to the funerals, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, have conducted several of them myself. I have not yet experienced the box, but expect it to come someday. But it's around us. I think if I was to ask you, do you like life or death? Do you prefer to walk in life rather than death? We like it then. Well, before us is life or death. <coughs> Choose what you will nourish, what I will nourish. Father in heaven, help me, Gary Cody today and from this day onward to nourish the life that is in me, the life of God. I need to nourish daily 
Because if I'm not nourishing your character, your conduct, and your concerns, your personhood, your conversion, your change in me, then I'm nourishing that which is not you, which will lead to death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. I am the bread of life. There's no other way. In Jesus' name. Just as I prayed, Gary Cody wants life. I want to nourish the life of God in me. So you need to pray that as well. I wish I could do it. You know, don't you wish you could just plug people in and see them mature and grow? And It doesn't happen, does it? You know, you can instruct your child. You can correct your child. You can do all kinds of things. But really what it's going to come down to in the end is that they need to mature. And sometimes what you see as behavior on a five-year-old is funny when they're five, maybe even six. But when they turn 12 and 13, it's not so funny. True? Just as there's certain behavior that you'll see in yourselves or in others, that when they're 12 and 13 or five or 16, and if it's appropriate behavior for that age, it can be funny. But when they're 25, 30, and 35 and still acting the same way, it's not so funny. Well, by the same token, there's certain levels that we should be coming to at this point in our lives of saying, you know, I've got to start nourishing this God in me, this Christ in me, this new creation in Christ. And if that be, that be you, that you would say, yes, that's me. I want to mature in Christ. I want to be more than I was yesterday. I want to grow in the things of God. I want to nourish. I want to understand the bread of life. The life that God has provided, the bread that has been provided, Christ Jesus has been provided. I want you to nourish. If that's you, I'm just going to ask that you would stand before him. I'm not going to call you forward. I don't feel led to do so. I'm just going to ask that you would stand before him and say, I want the bread of life in me. You're just standing before the Lord. That's it. Just before him. And you may say, well, I already have the bread. Well, so do I. I already have Christ in me. Well, so do I. I just want all of him in me. More of him in me. I want Christ in me. Just stand before him and say, Lord, that's me. I just want more of him. I want more of God in my life. I need more of God in my life. <clears throat> I want the nourishing aspect of the Lord to nourish me, the life that is in me. This is what we're looking for. God in our lives, to touch our souls. I'm not going to settle in. You know, we can get comfortable with the things of God. We can settle in. You know, is that not so? We can just kind of settle in and say, well, you know, I know God. I, I know the Bible. I go to church. I listen. And, and I know I'm saved. And I know I'm going to heaven. I know that too. I am. And I know very well that I could probably sit in the pew, not preach anymore, and just relax and just be comfortable. And I know I probably, by the grace of God, will still make it to heaven. But is that really what we want? I want you, Lord, in my life more than ever before. I want you to discipline who I am. Discipline my mind, my heart, my being. I want to be a giver. I want to be able to forgive. I want God Almighty in my life. Just standing before Him. Not before me and not before each other, but before the witnesses of God, saying, Lord, that's me. That's me. The glory that has been deposited in my life, I want it to grow and mature and that I would not be ashamed of His coming but that I would receive the full blessing that he has for me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. And I thank you, Lord, that men and women gather together as the saints and believers of God to receive the bread of life. I pray, Father, that those who are standing stood, stood as believers in Christ, that we would grow, that we would acknowledge you, and that we would yield to who you are in our lives. Help us to be overcomers because you have overcome the world. Bless and encourage. Take what has been planted in the hearts of each of us, Lord, and make it come forth and bring forth fruit that goes in abundance beyond measure, that we would be a blessing to others. Father in heaven, bless this body of believers in Jesus' wonderful and holy name. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, walk with God. Be encouraged today. Amen and amen.